Good day. My name is Brian R. Smith, and I'm a student at Full Sail University where I'm going for my mobile gaming master's there. I'm working on a program called World War I Flying Circus, and I'm going to take you through milestone number one as part of that project. So without further ado, let me uh, share my screen. And I'm just going to do the whole desktop just to make things easy. Uh, here is milestone number one in a uh, Google document, and I'm not going to go through or, or uh, you're welcome to read everything here. Just pause the video and read everything. But uh, this was the milestone number one as I originally envisioned. And uh, probably the big thing is what I was picturing for this basic flight school introduction is uh, normally if you're doing a flight simulator, you, you, you climb into your, the cockpit of your airplane and you're flying around. And a lot of times they have you flying through rings that are floating in the air. So you basically you're, you're able to then you know, pilot your, your airplane with that. I was going to do something similar with World War I Flying Circus, but serendipity happened. I was looking out for 3D objects uh, on the internet, looking for some kind of rings to be floating in the air, spinning around, doing different things. And I couldn't find any that really were uh, satisfactory for what I was looking for, kind of the you know, World War I era based rings. And, uh, but I ran across a, a Zeppelin, a dirigible, a balloon. And I thought, wow, Instead of doing the floating rings, uh, let me do a balloon busting scenario. And the same kind of thing, instead of having the ring floating in the space where you want uh, the, uh, where, where you want to be navigating your biplane to, so you can be going through that ring, how about having a dirigible or balloon floating in space and then you need to navigate your biplane so that you can be shooting at the, at the balloon. Great idea. And so I um, downloaded the, well, paid for and then downloaded the, uh, the dirigible. And so really, the, it follows this same kind of structure, but instead of floating through rings, it's going to be a balloon busting scenario to really turn out a lot better than I originally had envisioned. So let me take you into, uh, into the game itself. So here we are in, in Unity in the World War I Flying Circus, and I'll fire that up again. And uh, so we can just see here, this is the emulation working away. Uh, I'm hearing the background music in my ear. And that's kind of annoying. So I'm going to go to the settings here and actually shut off uh, all the different noises that are going on there and then back out again. So here is the, um, this used to be a, uh, an, um, a robot. And eventually I do want to have an AI opponent, but we're right now is a good select here is this um, you know, busting balloons. And you notice this is in between ground school. So the assumption is the, uh, the user will come here and they'll maybe go to the ground school, which would be kind of the uh, written rules about the game, different maneuvers and some more information about uh, how to play the game. I'm going to make the assumption, though, that they're not going to read the go to ground school. They're just going to skip that and, and go directly into balloon busting or maybe to try the, uh, uh, this is the pass and play, be able to try the pass and play and not quite figure out what's going on. So then they'll drop back to this balloon busting on a trainer plane. So it's a so really, it's in a beautiful spot between the, the ground school and the, the first kind of game that you can play, which is passing, the, passing uh, against your body and device or even playing against a network component, really fits quite well into there. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is before I'm going to go into there, I'm going to show you just in prestige here. This is not pretty yet. It's not uh, what I want it to be in the future. But it just shows that for this pilot, the prestige points is zero. This will be important as we come back to this later, of course. So here we are, balloon busting. Uh, so we're going to do our first balloon busting scenario. I've got uh, all this uh, recorded or you know, available. To, uh, I'm sorry, presented as a text here. We can go back to the home screen, or we can go back to the balloon busting. We can start our first balloon busting scenario, do whatever maneuver we want to do, and um, and then go back. And we can always then surrender. So it's a lot of options of getting around to different places. If you do surrender, you lose all the prestige points you have uh, gained um, up to that point, uh, but you can watch a, a uh, reward video here and get an extra 10 prestige points this way. So we'll close that and just show you that here we are getting those uh, prestige points. Okay, so back to here and we're gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate the balloon busting. So here's that introductory, how to do you know, this balloon busting. We're gonna fly to our first mission and so here is the um, kind of the indication where I've, I've got a, um, 
I, I call it a, the icon hint over here. So it's text to kind of tell us about what this icon means. And of course, you're gonna to wanna to be able to find that icon. And then over here, I've called this the, uh, the big hint. And so this is kind of the, where the balloon is, and it's kind of telling you what kind of maneuver you're gonna be uh, doing to get there. Uh, and so then I've got these floating arrows that pop up uh, depending upon where you're gonna find this maneuver um, in all the different maneuvers that are available. So it's kind of indicating, hey, you wanna slide down to here, and you're gonna be wanting to go generally straight. And so you'll pick this maneuver, and the directions are, are here about, you know, uh, you, do, you do the slide for the turn and the speed, and you tap the green to again to confirm. So we do the maneuver, machine gun blasts go off, and then we go on to balloon busting scenario number two. And here we go. So here is now a left stall, and so we, we were given a hint that it's over here, and we can match and say, okay, here's my left stall. And notice too, the number of um, hits on the balloon are, are increment, incrementing, which is great. And here we are, we're doing the stall then over to the side. So after this, um, you notice if I start, we're, right now we're doing the, the wing over. And so this is the first fancy maneuver and it's the first cruising speed maneuver. And so I give them a little extra information about this icon and little hints over here. And we're gonna go to do the wing over. The animations, by the way, I, they're, they're uh, programmatic animations. So I'm not using Armin's animations yet. I am um, doing a, a, a linear interpretation of the where you start and where you go. So the, the animations are, are programmatic. Um, they're not the, the final animations. But I've got all 27 animations built into the machine, uh, in, into the uh, World War One Flying Circus. I'll show you how I do that a little bit later. So another wing over here. I'm not going to go through. Uh, well, I'll go through here for a few, few of these, but after after a while, I'm just going to kind of cheat and go really quick. And then this is going to be you're looking out of the tail end. So this is the Eilman, and that is a cruising straight maneuver with this fancy arrow like that. Once we get Armin's animations, they'll be doing all sorts of really cool things with the uh, um, um, with the Eilman. So um, here's just the straight cruising, and now. For the first time, we're getting introduced to the green confirmation as an expanded. It shows us how far you're going to be traveling uh, with these different maneuvers. And so we're still racking up the kills here. And this is going to be probably the last one we're going to do. So this is the, the fast uh, speed straight ahead. So after this, I'm just going to start cruising through and uh, not really paying attention to uh, where I'm going to go. And watch this. Oh, nothing exciting here. So anyway, just uh, lots of maneuvers. And uh, like I said, I'm just going to try to move through here. Did a, did a barrel roll there. I do have um, the ability in the code to cut back the, um, the number of um, maneuvers, you know, from 27 into something that's uh, a lot more reasonable, you know, definitely for testing, or um, I've got plans on, you know, kind of cutting that back down for other, other reasons too, to, um, if people don't want to go through all 27, the only way to get out of here is to surrender and uh, to give up. And so I want to give people kind of a you just learn the basics, basic maneuvers, and then maybe fancy maneuvers. So, uh, but right now it just does it just all twenty seven of them. Okay, so we got getting close to there. Notice flying through the balloon. So I still have a problem where where that if the plane and the balloon or the two planes are intersecting, I haven't figured out what to do if they're both in the same location. So that's that's a problem I need to fix here. So I wanted to demonstrate that. And here we go, we're going straight through there. Okay, so we're on to the, the 27th. And this is the, the one maneuver that is uh, it's a unique for the, uh, for the rotary airplanes. And so this is kind of this wide turn to come around. 
And uh, you can't go in the left direction to do that because it's uh, the rotary engine fights you in turning that direction. So, all right, we're all done here. We got nine kills. And uh, I was going to do like a percentage of kills and keep you more uh, interesting statistics, but you know, statistics are not ex exactly exciting for everybody. I can always add that into here, but basically just tell them that, hey, you've shot, you, you, you were able to get nine kills on the, on the balloon, and you can go to, to the home and get the same um, number, amount of prestige for that, or double it by watching a targeted video here. So that was nine plus the 10, so we should have 28. Right, so I doubled the nine, I got 18 plus the 10, so we got the 28 prestige points. So that's basically the, the balloon busting. So it leads um, the user through kind of the, um, as I'm showing them new iconic information in terms of the arrowheads and the stalls and the fancy maneuvers and the side slips and wing overs and all the different things that they can do and kind of demonstrates, give them, starts giving them a, a two-dimensional feel for where their plane is going to end up at the end of the maneuver, which is important because they need to know where their plane is going to end so that they can anticipate where the other plane is going to be simultaneously moving simultaneously at the same time. Okay, so that's the going through here, reward video, my prestige. Uh, so let me take you through some of the code to support all this. So here, let me, uh, oops. Get that a little bit smaller, stop that. And then, uh, so yeah, take you through the uh, the localization pipeline. So I was using Unity's localization and I was having some problems with it. A few few minor bugs where it just wouldn't fire up uh, uh, always, you know, for the, for the game. And generally you kind of want features to always work. Then the other is, um, sure looked in the documentation that there was ability to import and export to a CSV or via CSV to a spreadsheet because it's a lot easier to maintain um, um, <laughs> the, the, for the large multinational corporation I used to work for, we called it MRI, machine readable information, which was the, the, the information that was in English, but then also translated into the world's languages. And for whatever reason, we called it machine readable information. And I still call it machine readable information for the translated text that is going to be displayed to the users. So Anyway, better to, and easier to keep that information in CSV, but I couldn't figure out how to do it uh, to save my life in Unity, so I rolled my own uh, localization. I'm going to take you through that because I think it's fairly ingenious. Um, so starting here, I'm keeping my uh, localizations just in a Google Sheets, so just a document here. And you can see this is, uh, I got a, a key, a unique key that I evoke, you know, in my application, and then the English um, the English phrase here. And then what I do is I just use Google Translate and translate that into uh, the world's languages, as it were. So here's French. and just indicate that this is French, converting it from English into French. Here's the English source, and then, of course, translating it uh, right to there. So I generate all that uh, for all the different balloon. You know, these are the icon hints text, and this is the big balloon hints text, plus all the other supporting um, pages. What I'm doing is right now is not all the canvases, not all the text is translated in my, using my localization system. It's only when has it been adding new text messages or updating a screen, then I will um, incorporate uh, this so I, as I'm changing or adding things. And then what I do is I'm generating, uh, using this concatenation, I'm generating the string uh, that is and strings that are needed to uh, go into my program. And so what I would do is I would copy this and then into uh, my init values here is I would just copy it and then go down here and I would paste all of it into there. So it's just kind of a copy and paste and get it into the to the program here, update the translation number of rows as necessary, or if I got additional languages as necessary. And so this init values then uh, when it compiles, it's got all the all the values for, well, this is for the um, uh, default settings. It's got the values for the credits. And then this is the values for all the, the languages and the translations. So nice and copy, copy and paste. Plus it's got, you know, built-in helper routines to, um, to work with those. And this is kind of the, uh, the heavy lifting for the localization. And so you can see the different languages. I build up and read in these dictionaries. It's got the key mapped married to the you know the actual uh, text that is going to be translated and then 
uh, what I do is I'm, I had built, well, built into the role of one flying circus into the main logic. And if I was going to update a screen, I was hacking as people, you know, I say, let's say normal duos hacking the text right onto the screen. And uh, of course that's a bad way of doing it, but I was just doing it uh, to get it to be nice and quick. And now what I'm doing is as I'm updating canvases, I get access to all the different visual objects that are on that canvas. So I access that just once during a week. So you know, the performance is uh, rather minimal or just done once. And then once I have all that, then I've got a, an update routine for each one of these canvases where I basically get that information from the current language dictionary. And here is then the key that gets us into then that translated information comes back into here and then is assigned into the text or whatever I want to do uh, with that information on the screen. So um, as a way, it's kind of uh, a, a roll your own localization uh, for that. And uh, so that's the, I want to take you through that. And then the other business is in the World War I Flying Circus. What I'm going to do is scroll this down a little bit. And I've all the different places that I've, and this is the main application, all the different places where I've made changes in the uh, World War I Flying Circus. Um, I have I have a code there called MS. So we're just going to find all those. So the first one here is, this is in the update routine right here. Um, I've got just a little bit of logic. And, and basically what we're saying is um, that right here, yeah. So that if the, um, wh what I'm doing is I'm calculating to see if if um, if the enemy or if the other object is actually something that you can be shooting at. So in other words, if you're facing at it and if your distance is a certain a certain distance, and it basically is just a logic split between if I'm balloon busting, the target is going to be the zeppelin rather than the target being the plane B uh, transform the location of the plane B. And you can see here I often to keep the logic as simplified as possible. Um, inside of uh, inside of the the main World War One flying circus code, I will then pass parameters to these helper routines so that uh, it can keep the logic a little bit more um, convoluted there, or a little bit uh, 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 a little bit messy there. So it keeps the uh, the uh, this code a little bit easier to read. So same kind of thing down here is that if this is balloon busting, you know, then I am going to be updating the canvas player status, which is the information that's in the upper left and upper right hand corners. And I update that based upon that we are indeed doing blue and busting today and not a network game, for example. And then you know, information about um, you know, the keeping track of the balloon busting shots up there. So, um, so just little helper routines like that. And so I uh, keeping trying to keep the code here as simple as possible. So here's another, uh, another bit. Uh, at first, and, then, and, and Mr. Uh, Professor Penny, you and I played a game where I just had eight of the maneuvers kind of hard-coded, and here was the mathematics for that hard-coded maneuvers. What I did is I um, created something, uh, well, another, um, another helper class over here called maneuvers. And actually, uh, well, it took me a better part of a day because it was, I could, there was a nasty bug that I was trying to figure out. Uh, but this maneuvers, uh, three uh, right here. Um, what it does is that rather than hard coding for each of the 27 different maneuvers, it builds up a, I've got uh, pairs of, each maneuver is encoded with a series of pairs. I can show you the, how the maneuvers are encoded here. And so they have, for example, uh, this coding string is L1, F1, L1, which means it's going to turn left one, which this is hexagon, so it's left 60 degrees. It's going to go forward one in uh, the units. That's a, a, each hex from center to center is 200 meters. So it's going to go 60 degrees to the left, forward 200 meters, and then 60 degrees to the left again. So all the maneuvers have this kind of thing. R2 would be right two hex sides. So it'd be right 120 degrees. And probably the most uh, fun one is the barrel roll right here. So that's the, that's the barrel roll uh, right there. So but basically, it's a series of pairs of the L's for left, R's for right, and F's for forwards. And uh, if I can then sequence through those series of pairs, 
um, I can then determine where the object is going to be at the end of that maneuver uh, so that I can then, uh, I know where the object is to start with it, I know where it's going to be at the end, and then I do a linear interpretation between there for every phrase during the, uh, every frame during the update, and actually then just move the, you know, the biplane in that direction. So that's my emulation of the animation that hopefully then we'll get from Armin. Uh, so that's one bit I wanted to show you in here. The other is the trick with this. And boy, I fought this for the better part of a day, uh, like I said, but the trick is these kinds of transformations are best done on actual objects. I tried doing the mathematics, with sine, cosine, that kind of thing. And um, it's in Unity, it's very difficult to understand what is the angle uh, that this object is facing. Uh, uh, but if you have an object, you've got this forward position, which you can then use for right here, transform forward, actually know then which direction this thing is facing relative to, you know, the 360 degrees in the, uh, in the, in this position. So anyway, I, I just created a, a temporary object out there and I move that object around and then I just uh, make sure that that information then is passed back. And then I know then where the object is going to be. Uh, which is going to be my the biplane. Now, and for and this works uh, both for the pass and play and for the um, oh pass and play for network play and for the balloon busting. So it works for all of them. And then it added something else too is is uh, target hex wanted. So with the balloon busting, I will place you know I will know for this maneuver that I want to teach the user. You know, for if the maneuver is L one, I know that I'm going to be I'm sorry like F one. I'm going to be moving the biplane forward 200 meters, grand. But what I want to do is, so I know where the biplane should be if they're going to be successful in shooting at the balloon. But I want the balloon to actually be another hexagon in front of where the biplane is going to end in that facing direction. So in this very simplistic case, uh, basically what I do is, is hex wanted will move the object forward another hexagon, another 200 meters in the direction that it's facing, so that uh, you can see right here, so it's the object's position uh, plus another one distance forward in the direction that the object is facing. And then that will tell me where to put the balloon so that for the, you know, for the F1 maneuver, I put the balloon basically two hexagons in front of where the biplane is now. Makes sense, right? So that's all the fun. And it's a beautiful part is that this is now a loop and it's programmatic and it's calculating these positions. And so for all that, that's just, you know, one line of code uh, here where it was going to be just this ugly, 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 you know, kind of a whole table of 20 some things. And I didn't want to do that um, because it was just throwaway stuff anyway. Okay. So that was a little bit of fun there to make that all happen. And then uh, basically there's just some uh, action routines. Action routines are uh, basically when you press a button, I name the, uh, the methods action so that I can find them um, uh, alphabetically in, in Unity. And so these are just the action for the pass and play. And here's a create a, some actions that say, I want to start the balloon busting. And then uh, each time you say, I want to do on, go on to the next scenario in balloon busting, I got a little bit of work to do there to kind of set that up uh, there. And you can see too is like uh, you know here I am localizing you know, my screen for the canvas win lose, and uh, I, I need to know that it's bloom busting and other information so that I can uh, give you know uh, use the same text fields but I can put different words and different messages in there. So again, it it really simplifies the code here because I'm kind of offloading a lot of that work in this uh, localization, um, you know, for the my localization. And let's just keep going through here. Oh, I just want to show you nothing to do with uh, this code, but just wanted to show you as, as I promised, if you come up with really good ideas, I name them in the code. So this action for the quick play, uh, that was your original idea, Professor Penny. And so you actually look there, this is the action quick play Penny, it's got a great ring to it. And so the, it's actually named in the code this way. Of course, it won't show up anywhere in the game, um, but uh, there it is named into there, but uh, so. That's that. And then um, just another example of kind of this localization where I'm passing to 
you know, the, um, you know, to the localization to say, hey, this is a balloon busting. So they're going to give a different kind of message there versus if you're playing against a human. And, oh, look, I just wanted to show you to the calculating the shot damages. This is, you know, really kind of convoluted logic. And I wanted to keep that uh, a lot easier in the main uh, section in that uh, update routine. But over here is where I actually, I know that it is balloon busting today. And so we're doing different things because if it's balloon busting inside of this is a, um, a close range hit. So this first one is to make sure that we are, um, it, we're facing at the target uh, from the, you know, from the shooting plane to whatever the thing that we're shooting at that we're actually facing it within a certain uh, dot product. And then if it's a certain within a certain distance that, you know, this is distance one, so it's the close distance so within the 200 meters, then you know, we do vibrating shots and all the different things. But yeah, if it's balloon busting, we do something a little bit, a little bit different. I just have one bit of damage for a successful uh, shoot at the balloon at the close distance, where the, um, for the other uh, game, it'd be four points of damage. You can see there kind of the hover dam, uh, damage distance one is four for regular uh, biplane kind of shooting at other biplanes. And then if we're uh, medium range, um, we have not balloon busting and for long range, we don't, uh, we don't do anything for the balloon busting. So again, convoluted logic, but trying to protect the overall flow in the World War One and Flying Circus. So it's a lot easier to work with. So that's basically the, the code. So I, I, for the pass and play, for the network play, and for the balloon busting, all those different plays, I'm reusing the, um, you know, the selection of the different um, uh, maneuvers and reusing a lot of the screens, a lot of the information, a lot of the logic, uh, where it's a little bit different, then I've got my if then else to kind of branch out. But really trying to keep it all um, separated so that I've got all these helper routines that I've been creating rather than keeping everything just in one uh, big um, class, which is one of your recommendations. And then this localization, which abstracts, um, well, first of all, it's the localization is kind of the interface between these, uh, these initial values that I get from that uh, spreadsheet that is actually copy and paste it in. And, and then two, what I'm doing now is um, keeping it so that it's localization is updating entire canvases at a time. So from my World War I Flying Circus, I can just make one call and then localization can handle some of the messier logic about what kind of, you know, beer, am I fighting against, uh, am I the beer boy today? Am I Baron Von Red or am I Lord Olive? So I can abstract those kinds of things, keep it very simple in the, the main code and keep it more complex here when I'm updating the canvases. And then if there's any problems with the translation from a localization point of view or from text point of view, I know where to look. Uh, it's, it's somewhere in here or somewhere in my initial values. And then just different helper routines for that. So that's a kind of a whirlwind tour through uh, through the code. Um, and MS1. The next thing I want to just show you was uh, next week um, for my task sheet. I'm going to be going into um, the milestone number two. I'm going to be finishing up and cleaning up all the different settings. And so there's some settings I don't have anything for, like the special effects volume and turning vibrations on and off. So there'll be brand new settings and all that. So I'm going to be finishing up and um, you know, polishing up the, the settings. The splash screen, I don't have any kind of splash screen right now. So I've got some ideas about what I wanted to accomplish there. And some of it is an optimization of it is, uh, um, is well, yeah, there's between the, the difference between awake and uh, start, I want to kind of move things in the proper places so that um, you know, awake, which is one of the first things it's called, fires up and I want to make sure that I've got connectivity to the different places so that by the time the start happens and all the starts kind of flow simultaneously, they run in parallel. So there's sometimes there's timing issues with that. So anyway, I just want to make sure everything is done in awake before then I start firing up the starts. And then uh, sound and music, I've got you know, some of it, you know, the background music and I've got uh, you know, the machine gun sounds and all that but I wanna create a lot more um, affordance in terms of the, the mechanical things of the different sliders and buttons. I want them to, you know, to be more of a real physical old world kind of you know, click, click, click you know, kind of sounds and all that. So I've got some, you know, some um, English definitions of these uh, sounds, a mechanical click and audible soft click. I'm gonna to have to listen to you know, probably 500 different sounds to like 
that's the sound that I want. And then, um, well, that's the, yeah, so that's the, the different, three different big tasks uh, for um, the milestone number two, A, B, and C. So that's the, the goals for next week. So with that, uh, it's kind of a um, uh, quick tour through the changes for the milestone number one. Um, it all started out with you know, kind of the trope flying through the rings. And just because I couldn't find a, uh, you know, a nice 3D kind of image for that, and I ran across a really beautiful uh, dirigible, downloaded it and um, you know, turned it into bloom busting, which is a lot better and a stronger kind of storyline uh, for this pilot who is in between the cusp of you know, trying to learn how to play this game and wants to start you know, playing against his friends or maybe some network opponents. So it's a great, um, um, great thing to help him or her understand um, the maneuvers and uh, but I do definitely want to see your fingerprints all over this. Uh, this was this was as I envisioned it, uh, but that doesn't mean it is good or it, it and it for sure means it can be improved. So I'm looking for your your thoughts and comments about that. So with that, um, without any further ado, I'm going to stop my sharing and stop the recording. So thank you very much and looking forward to your comments about this.